Now, when we pass the needle through the interlaminar space to get into the vertebral canal, looking at this cross section, we're coming in from the posterior side, you would first enter this space called the epidural space. In the epidural space, we're going to have fat and a fairly dense plexus of veins, but no cerebrospinal fluid. And then we'll have the dura and arachnoid. And past that, we'll have the subarachnoid space, which contains the cerebrospinal fluid. And then beyond that, we'll have the pia mater covering the spinal cord. But of course, when we're doing a lumbar puncture, we don't want to be in a region where the spinal cord might be damaged, and therefore we have to stay below the spinal cord. So, when we pass, th uh, when we do a lumbar puncture, let's be cognizant of the layers that we have to pass through. So we've already said that the needle is passed through the interlaminar space, it's done in the midline, and it's done with the vertebral column flexed. And then we can take a look at the layers that we're going to pass through, starting from the outside and working our way in. We'll pass through the skin and then superficial fascia, deep fascia, then the supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, and then finally through the interlaminar space, which gets us into the vertebral canal. We first will reach the epidural space, then the dura, and then the arachnoid, and then the subarachnoid space, remembering that it is in the subarachnoid space that we have the cerebrospinal fluid the epidural space contains only fat and veins. We said that we want to avoid any risk of damage to the spinal cord, so that means we need to know where the spinal cord ends. What's the inferior limit of the spinal cord? And in the average adult, the spinal cord ends at about the interspace between the first and second lumbar vertebra, on average. Now, recognizing that that's an average is important. That means that for any individual patient, we don't really know where the bottom of the spinal cord for that patient is. We know that the average is around here, but it could be a little lower, it could be a little higher. And to be sure that we will avoid the spinal cord, we want to stay as far below the spinal cord as possible. So we go to the lower interlaminar spaces. However, the other important issue we have to deal with is that we want to go in to, uh, with our lumbar puncture to a level where there is a subarachnoid space, because usually we're uh, wanting to get cerebrospinal fluid out or to put something into the cerebrospinal fluid. So to know where the, we need to know where the bottom of the subarachnoid space is, and again, on average, it's at about the level of S2. Again, for any individual patient, it could be a little higher, it could be a little lower. And so we want to go above S2 for a while to make sure we're in the subarachnoid space. So when you combine those two thoughts, saying that we want to be low enough to be sure that we miss the spinal cord, but high enough to be sure that we stay in the subarachnoid space, we find the midpoint between those two limits that brings us to L4. And it's for that reason that we use the, interspace, the interlaminar space either just above L4 or just below L4 as the level at which we do a lumbar puncture. And on a patient, you can identify the L4 level because that is the level at which the iliac crest will be palpated. And so if you just draw a line across the patient's back from one iliac crest to the other, that line will go across the spine of the L4 vertebra. You can palpate that spine and then slide your finger up or down a short distance until you feel a depression. And that will be either the L3-4 into space or the L4-5 into space. And that's where the lumbar puncture is done. And the point that this diagram makes is that depending upon how far you advance that needle, through the interlaminar space will determine whether the needle reaches the epidural space or whether the needle reaches the subarachnoid space. If your purpose is to withdraw CSF in order to have an analysis of CSF done or to measure CSF pressure, then obviously we need to advance into the subarachnoid space. If you want to administer a spinal anesthesia, then you have to get into the subarachnoid space. On the other hand, if you want to introduce an epidural anesthesia, then you would get into only as far as the epidural space and not penetrate the dura and arachnoid, staying in the epidural space. One more opening to take note of 
is seen at the bottom of the sacrum on the posterior side, and it's seen right here, and it's called the sacral hiatus. It's also palpable on a patient. It's just above the natal cleft. You can put, place your finger and feel the sacral hiatus, and you can slide a needle up into the sacral hiatus. That's called the caudal approach. So when caudal anesthesia is done, the needle is introduced through the sacral hiatus. Now remember that the subarachnoid space typically only comes down to about S2, so when we go through the caudal hiatus, we're not entering the subarachnoid space, we're entering the epidural space, as can be seen on this slide. So when you come up through the, through the, through the sacral hiatus, you're in this epidural space, you're not in the subarachnoid space, so when doing caudal anesthesia, by definition, that means you're doing epidural anesthesia, not spinal anesthesia.